Welcome once again to Verbatim Word, where we consider biblical truth in a daily context. This is Justin Gary. In the last episode, we saw that God is a God who delivers. He delivers us from our sin by substituting himself for us, and he delivers us from this present evil age, plucking us up by the roots to bear fruit and not thorns, and in hope to uproot us one day and to take us home to be with him. Today we pick up in Galatians chapter 1, beginning in verse 6, and Paul jumps right away into a warning. He wants to be loud and clear. A warning is meant to be heeded and calls for a response. When we return to the United States from serving as missionaries overseas, we moved to Oklahoma, which is my wife's home state. I knew a bit about Oklahoma, but not much. But one thing I did know about the state was tornadoes. I asked Aaron a bit about storm season when we initially moved, and yet nothing quite prepared me for that first year. Storm season is traditionally in the spring, from April through June, and our first storm season home was 2013, which was a rough year for storms in our neck of the woods. It was the year that an EF5 tornado tore through Moore, Oklahoma, and then a week and a half later, an EF3 bore through El Reno, just west of Oklahoma City. It was a sober introduction to me for, to storm season. That was also the time we moved into our home, just at the end of April, in the middle of storm season. And right near our home, about 100 yards away, is a storm siren. It's set to go off to warn everyone for miles that a storm is approaching. It, sound is, it sounds that ominous wail that distinctly warns. The first time it went off when we lived here, I happened to be working in the yard. And that warning sound was so loud and so clear and so foreboding that it caused an involuntary physical response as I jumped, well, actually I leapt, and it scared the jeepers out of me. There was no doubting in my mind and my body what I needed to do. I was in the house in about five seconds flat, driven by so much adrenaline, and the warning siren, it did its trick. It got me inside to a safe place to turn on the news to see what was coming, which thankfully for us that day, we ended up being fine. Paul is sounding the alarm to the churches in Galatia. He tells these churches that something dangerous is threatening them, so he doesn't ease into it gently. Paul jumps right in with some strong words, and that's where we pick up today. Now that Paul has finished his introduction in Galatians, he gets right to business in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 10. If you have a Bible, go ahead and read there. If not, I'll read it for us. Verse 6 says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. In verse 8, But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, If anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. In verse 10, For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Paul said, I marvel that you are turning away so soon. Paul marveled. We saw this word in a previous podcast. Here it means to be in wonder. It is a very curious thing. Paul had spent some time scratching his head over this. What had Paul perplexed was that, according to verse 6, they were turning away so soon. When Paul had entered the regions of Galatia and shared the simple gospel of Jesus, the people of Galatia embraced it. They were passionate, on fire. They hungered and responded when they heard that Jesus had offered himself as a perfect substitutionary sacrifice. They were sponges, truly soaking up all that Paul had shared. But now Paul is scratching his head, because so soon after, they're turning away. Because the Judaizers were always hot on Paul's tail to swoop in after he left, to sow their tainted seeds of a law-infused gospel. The turning away that Paul speaks of, the Greek word is metatithemi. It means to transpose two things, to put one thing in place of another, or to switch spots. It can also mean to change, and can also mean to desert from one thing to another. So it had military usage, 
for deserters who defected to the other side. This gospel that the Judaizers were teaching, it was not just a supplement that they were adding to their diet. It was a meal replacement. The Galatians had transposed it. And the good gospel of grace that Paul had left with the Galatians was being replaced and switched out by a gospel of works. And in effect, they were deserters, going back to the law from the winning side of grace. And Paul is scratching his head because this is happening so soon. Now, it is very likely that these people in Galatia had not seen it that way. But Paul wants to sound the warning loud and clear. He said in verses 6 and 7, They were turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. The word different at the end of verse 6 is the Greek word heteros. It can mean another, but another not of the same form, kind, or class. We get the word heterosexual, one attracted to someone not of the same form, kind, or class. If, for example, I was referring to forms of transportation, and when I was a teenager, I went from a bicycle to another or a heteros mode of transportation, a car, let's say, the second is not the same form, kind, or class. The bicycle is not the same as a car. Paul says they are turning from the grace of Christ to a different gospel, not of the same form, kind, or class. In verse 7, when he says, which is not another, the word another is alos. This is a different kind of another. It's another of the same sort. So, for example, back to transportation, if you sell a 2019 two-wheel drive automatic blue four-door sedan and buy a different 2019 two-wheel drive automatic red four-door sedan, it's alos. It's another of the same sort. It's just a different color, a slight variation. Paul said this other gospel that the Judaizers brought, that the Galatians were so quick to turn to, was something that was completely different. It was a bike versus a car. The two messages, law and grace, could not be considered equal. And Paul reiterates in verse 7, it was not another of the same kind or quality. It was not alos. It was not comparable. It was actually inferior. And Paul wondered at the fact that they would give up something so quality, the gospel of grace, for something so inferior, a gospel of Jesus plus something else, or a gospel of works, and that they would do it so soon. When Paul had left Galatia, the believers were passionate about their new faith. They were ready to go deeper. Now, there is a tendency when someone seeks to go deep with God, the first thing someone considers is, what can I do to be more devoted? And by mistake, the easiest thing to grasp for is man-made rules or standards. In our newfound devotion or zeal to be more passionate for Christ, we tell ourselves that if we can just do a bit more or cut something out, we will be more holy and accepted. So the Galatians were probably in a pretty vulnerable place to fall into this trap. Now, when we seek to go deeper in our relationship with God, things likely will change in our attitudes, choices, actions, and even activities that we engage in, because there is a natural or supernatural process of sanctification that comes from living in relationship with Christ, where naturally, as the Holy Spirit works in me, I discover that some of my old ways of doing things are not acceptable to God or not conducive to a growing intimate relationship with Him. So by the Spirit's prompting and with the Spirit's power and guidance, my life goes through a renovation process, and I begin to make and undergo changes in this natural sanctification process. There's a house near us that went through a renovation a couple of years ago. They gutted that thing from the inside out. They gutted the drywall, the windows, doors, cabinets, and they brought it all out on the front lawn and heaped it into a dumpster. And it took a while. And then slowly they began to piece the house back together. It's the same house today, but it looks a lot better. And Jesus, when we invite him into our lives, reserves the right to fix things up. And he gets to work sanctifying us, making an unholy life more holy. But it is something that the Spirit does over time. 
But sometimes when we have good intentions and a desire to grow with God, we undergo or implement the unnatural process of becoming more holy by implementing legalistic measures, a new set of rules and do's and don'ts that we vow to live under. And sometimes we begin to put these things upon other people as well as our standard of what Jesus likes. The problem with this approach is it is only as good as our discipline and our will. And like a bad diet, as soon as we're given an opportunity to cheat, we will do it. Because while we have implemented outward change, the inward change of the heart is lagging behind. The Galatians may have been duped to thinking they liked the immediate results that came with implementing the legalism that the Judaizers brought. They felt like they were going deeper, growing in holiness, making sacrifices for God. But Paul, the warning siren, says, it is not the true pure gospel. It is a perversion, something good and pure and right that has been twisted, and a corrupt variation of something good that was intended. Now Paul wants his warning sound to be loud and clear, so he repeats it. Verse 8, But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. First, let's look at the seriousness of promoting a tainted, inferior, perverted gospel. Let him be accursed, Paul says. The word implies no hope for being redeemed. They have turned to the dark side, and they won't be back. The reason why I think Paul could state this so strongly goes back to what Jesus said. If anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it's better to put a millstone around their neck and be thrown into the sea. Here's the reason. Only one gospel saves. An inferior one, like Judaizers preached, cannot save. And by teaching it in Galatia, they gave a false hope, a false security. And those who believe and follow a works-based gospel and get to the end of their life and try to get into heaven with their resume will be prohibited from entering in. This happens all the time around big events like sporting events or concerts or the Super Bowl. People buy tickets online. They pay the money, they get the tickets, they book their flights, they book their hotels, they travel to the event, they get to the event and get denied entrance at the very gate because the tickets they bought are counterfeit and there's no seat for them waiting inside the arena. What a disappointment. Jesus taught a parable in Matthew 22 about a wedding feast. A king had arranged a wedding feast for his son. A lot goes on in this parable, which we won't get into. The originally invited guests reject the invitation, which many would say Jesus was speaking to the Jews who had rejected his invitation. More are invited afterwards, including outcasts, and the reception hall is eventually filled. It seems that the king had made all the preparations, even down to providing wedding garments for the guests, since those who ended up coming had not exactly been shopping for out outfits online before coming, and their attendance was spontaneous or last minute. So when the king spots one there in the banquet hall without the provided garment, but wearing his own garment, the man is bound and removed from the celebration, cast out into the dark. He came wearing his own robe and not the robe that was provided. It's interesting, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, their eyes were open and they realized that they were naked. And God provided garments by sacrificing in the innocent blood of animals in the first substitutionary sacrifice, providing those skins as clothing. We all have a need to be covered in righteousness. But as the parable of the wedding feast shows, only a covering or robe of righteousness that God provides will be accepted. Any we provide for ourselves is inferior and just won't do it. When we are clothed in grace, we can enter in. In our own works, it won't cut it. When we buy into a gospel of works, it is a counterfeit. We can be sincere. We can have good intentions. We can be dedicated even. We can go through all the preparation of attending, but we show up and get to the banquet and there's no entrance provided for us. Any other gospel other than the pure gospel cannot save. 
And so the peddlers of that gospel, Paul says, should be anathema, accursed, because they are leading people astray, promising entrance, but selling tickets that have no value. There's another problem, though. Paul mentions in his warning the sources of this false gospel. While he knows the law-loving Judaizers were the ones to share it in Galatia, he uses an argument of extremes, an if-even argument. First, he says, if even we bring a false gospel. Paul acknowledges that man, even himself, makes mistakes. And while during his first time through Galatia, Paul could guarantee that it was a true, pure gospel, if he were ever to come back through and preach a new revelation of Jesus Christ, Paul says, do not listen to me. Do not believe a word. I can appreciate Paul's humility here. He knew that as long as he held on to the true gospel, submitted to the Lord Jesus, and was led by the Holy Spirit, the message would never change, because Paul was simply a vessel and a messenger to be used. But Paul also recognized that if he ever turned his eyes on himself, or got caught up in the power and influence of being an apostle, or started to believe falsely that he was pretty important in the spread of the kingdom, or moved away from the original foundational gospel that he had taught, he recognized that his message could change for some personal benefit. And if that were to happen, Paul said, do not believe me. It's sad to watch people God has used in our lives sometimes go astray. People we admired or listened to or looked up to or ministered alongside. But it does happen when great men and women of God take their eyes off Jesus. And there is grace and forgiveness in Christ if they repent, though often their ministries to us and to others are never the same. But the message that they originally shared was the true message, and it brought fruit in our lives. And that fruit continues today, even if they have strayed from that original foundational message. And Paul recognizes that he is just a man. He's saved by grace. So he tells the Galatian believers that if he shows up, and if his teaching sounds different, if he brings some new revelation to add to the old basic truths, Paul says, kick me out. Don't listen to a word. In addition, Paul says that even if an angel from heaven showed up to add to the gospel, don't listen to the angel. There was not going to be any further additional revelation from heaven to change the way that man would approach God. There would not be the establishment of new rules or new requirements. There would not be new testaments or tablets to have to read. There would not be new religious structures or leadership hierarchy to submit to in order to truly be a part of God's kingdom. If an angel appeared to them in the desert or the forest or in a dream and preached anything else than the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and salvation by grace through faith, let that angel and all who follow be accursed, anathema. A good point to make here is that all we teach and do and believe should be measured up and verified with the Bible. And though God may communicate in divine supernatural ways even today, those messages will only confirm what is already revealed to us in the scripture, but will not lead us off into another direction. So Paul says, if an angel shows up with a new gospel, don't listen. This does not sit well with many in a tolerance-centered, don't-be-so-narrow world. But understand Paul's heart here. His strong stand has nothing to do with arrogance or bigotry. Paul says this with compassion and conviction and in complete love, because he loves the Galatians and does not want them denied entrance in the end, and because he loves these false teachers even who may bring another gospel. And by standing up to them in love, the Galatians would point these false teachers back to the true gospel as well, while there is still time. There are many people in the world today, even maybe our friends or family members or co-workers, who have bought into false gospels. There are many false gospels today that preach Jesus plus something else. The name of Jesus may be used. They may even use the Bible as text. But there's a system that is set up for them to relate to God, and the system they seek to draw others into may have a few characteristics. First of all, it may be a system that makes you dependent upon membership in their church 
or submissive to their church leadership and all the hierarchy and systems and rituals and rites that you now have to implement to truly be a good member in good standing. Second of all, they may change Jesus's identification. He may no longer be God in the flesh. He may now be a son of God or a created being or a prophet, but he's no longer God in the flesh. Jesus, even if he shares Jesus's name, if it's not the same nature as the biblical Jesus, is not the same Jesus. I went to high school with someone named Brian Adams. I also went to a concert a few years ago by someone named Brian Adams. They were not the same Brian Adams. One was a guy who grew up on Maui. Another one is a famous musician, not the same guy. Just because it's the name of Jesus, if it's not the same nature of Jesus, it's not the same Jesus. And third of all, it could be a system that adds works to what Jesus has already done. And believing what Jesus did for us is just part of your salvation. But through your works, you can make God accept you. So there's a lot of emphasis on doing things, traditions, rituals, rites, pilgrimages, gaining proselytes, and going and doing these things to secure your salvation, not just as an expression of your salvation. That's the classic difference between biblical Christianity and other religious forms. All others have a strive to work up to God. But he came down to us in biblical Christianity. He knew that we could not work our way to him, so he completed it for us. We probably all know wonderful, sincere, devoted, good people who prescribe to this works-based kind of teaching, which Paul is warning about. Paul says first, don't believe them. The primary goal is to protect themselves from confusion. It's interesting how some of these kinds of religious systems pursue others and make it a high priority to make converts, mandating witnessing, requiring missions work of members, and some of the greatest success in pseudo-Christian groups is converting to their creeds Christians who do not know their Bibles very well. You see a lot of growth in some of these groups in traditionally Christian nations. People had a sincere desire for faith or a Christian background, but no firm foundation in what the Bible really says. So they buy in to whatever they are told and accept it. Paul says, don't believe it. But as another dynamic in the situation, how can those who do believe and practice an inferior gospel that does not save be redirected back to true biblical foundations? I personally believe that there are people in those systems who may truly know God and may be in heaven with us one day. But these are people who see through the works-based gospel and have a sincere understanding of what Christ did and trust wholly upon him and his work. They realize that no matter what they do, they will never be able to approach God, and so they need a gift of grace from him. But because of their geography or nationality or family, that's all they've ever known. And yet they have a saving relationship with Jesus because God sees their heart. They have discovered the truth among the untruths, and God may give them opportunity to leave that system one day. As Paul experienced on the road to Damascus, which led him out of that system. It's interesting, Paul always went to the synagogue first when he went to preach the gospel, because he still had a heart to reach those who were bound up in the same system from which he had come, because he knew that if he could find his way out, so could others. I think one of the best ways to reach those who are in such a situation is to live in a grace based relationship with Jesus so they can see your life as an example. And they will see the contrast as you rest and they work. A few years back, my wife and I went to New York City and we stayed in an Airbnb on Central Park. And this Airbnb, we had our own separate room, our own separate space, but it was actually in the apartment of the person running it out. And she was an older lady who had come from a Jewish background. And so we were there, and as conversations began to go, it came up at some point that we had been in ministry, that we had been missionaries overseas and lived overseas, and that we were Christians, and she was a Jewish person. And, and so I understood a lot of the Old Testament. So we were able to dialogue on many of those things that had been in her Jewish foundation. And she kept saying to me, she's like, you remind me a lot of my rabbi. You remind me a lot of my, my rabbi. I guess he was a little bit younger and he was zealous and, and passionate about the things of God. But we reminded, I reminded her of, of her rabbi. 
And so as the conversations got deeper and deeper, I began to ask her about righteousness. And I began to ask her about the sacrificial system. And I said, so, you know, in Christianity, we trust in the fact that Jesus has died for our sins as our final sacrifice. Well, in the Jewish system, they used to provide the sacrifices of those animals, those substitutionary sacrifices to symbolically cover over their sins. But since the temple is no longer there in Israel, how do they go about that? How do they cover those sins? And she was stumped. She couldn't figure it out. And she said, you know, I don't exactly know. I'm going to have to ask my rabbi about that. But my wife and I were able to live in her apartment for a number of days and just show her what it was like for us as Christians to live under grace, to live in God's unconditional and unfailing love for us, to live under the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And when it came to that point, she had to be in questioning for herself, what was she trusting in her righteousness for? In works that could no longer be accomplished because there was no temple in Jerusalem? Or resting in the completed work of Jesus Christ like we were? Another thing is to share the word with people who are caught up in these systems. I remember on the mission field serving weekly in a retirement home. At first, we were just doing kind, good things. We were taking the residents out on walks. We were playing cards with them, maybe playing music for them, serving them cookies and coffee. And as we made friendships with them, more conversations opened up about faith. It became clear that many of them identified with a religious system that was very works-based and had many extra biblical traditions that these residents were falsely believing had saved them. So we began to consider how to approach it. Do we go in and just start tearing down these beliefs one by one? Like taking a baseball bat each week and just swinging at one belief and then the next belief until we could knock over as many as we could. Likely, if we had done so, the door for conversation would quickly close. So as we were seeking the Lord about what to do, we were reading in Romans chapter 10. And it says there, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the encouragement to us by the Holy Spirit was just teach my word, just share my truth, just teach the truth of the Bible, sow it in their lives, sow it in their hearts as you're given opportunity to do so. And as time goes on, they will begin to see and discern what is not biblical about what they've been taught or what they believe. So we did just that. We began to have a Bible study with them and the discussions that we would have afterwards, they started to notice things. They would say things like, we've always been taught or believe this or that, but we still haven't heard about that yet in all these Bible studies. Why not? And we began to explain, well, actually, that belief you have or that tradition you have is not in the Bible. It's not something God gave to us. It's something that man has added to it. Or as we were reading through a passage, they say, wait a second, today we read this. So why have we always done this or believed that? Because that verse contradicts with what we do or what we practice or what we believed. Faith came by hearing and hearing by the word of God. As the word of God washed them, they began to see what was biblical and what was not. There are some people in our lives that are so close, but so far from the things of God. Pray for them. Live the grace-based life in front of them. Share the word with them. Paul is sounding the alarm pretty loud and clear right from the start. He wants to confront the issue immediately, and he wants to explain why in verse 10. Verse 10 of Galatians chapter 1 says, For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Paul realized that in the system he grew up in, that for many years it was all about pleasing man. It was all about making sure that outwardly everything looked like he was doing just fine, crossing his T's and dotting his I's. And that's where legalism usually leads us. When I was in college, I was part of a team. And this was the time when that famous dance, the Macarena, was going around the world and was a craze that everyone was into. And this team was paid at uh, sports uh, timeouts to actually go into the stands and to do the Macarena and to get the crowd pumped with the Macarena. Now, at the beginning, when the Macarena first came out, everyone was into it. And so as we went into the stands, we would start to do the Macarena, and people would join in and do the Macarena with us. But like any fad, it quickly fades. So basketball season is a pretty long season. It goes from November all the way until April or May, depending on how good your team is. 
towards the end of the season, people were not into the Macarena anymore. But guess what? The sponsor had paid us to continue to go into the stands to do the Macarena. So we would do the Macarena, smiles on our faces, as much energy, energy as we could. But by the end of the season, people were checking out. They were going to the snack bar. They were getting up to go to the restrooms. No one wanted to do the Macarena. But we had to keep up appearances and make it look like it was the coolest, raddest trend at the time, even though that ship had already sailed. So outwardly, with smiles on our faces, we were doing the Macarena. Inside, we were dying. Can I be anywhere else? Is there something else I could do? No one is into this. There's times when we're seeking to please men that we do the spiritual Macarena. Outwardly, we go through all the motions, smile on our faces. We are pumped. We are into this. But inwardly, there's no motivation. There's nothing in it. There's nothing behind it. Paul had done this for years as a Pharisee. So what relief came when Jesus Christ came and said, you don't need to do the outward stuff anymore. Man looks at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. And Paul had given up a long time ago seeking to please men by doing the outward things that would seek to entertain them, but inwardly dying on the inside. All that was saved when he came to Jesus Christ. Paul acknowledges that sometimes we hold back from sharing the truth with others because we do not want to offend. But Paul has compassion because he had once been blind too. He had once been a Pharisee. He had once been a hypocrite, doing things outwardly to look like he was righteous, but inside being very, very far from that. And it took a bright light and a powerful voice to stop him in his tracks and to remove the scales that had blinded his eyes. And now he was serving Jesus and delivering the message of the true gospel. Maybe you are listening to this and the Spirit is challenging you to consider that the religious system you find yourself in is a works-based approach to God or in a system that has added things to the gospel we find in the Bible. Maybe you have set up your own legalistic system or related to God and you are failing and falling short even by your own standard. Maybe the legalist inside of you feels it is too easy to just rest in grace and you find yourself striving to do more for God. Or maybe you're listening to this and you've never really heard that you're saved by grace through faith and you thought it was all just about being a good person. You know, when Paul was going to Damascus and he met Jesus on the road and the bright light shined brightly, he was blind and led in by his hands to Damascus where he spent three days praying. In that town was a Christian named Ananias. Ananias was led by the Spirit to come and pray for Paul and lay hands upon him. When he did so, scales fell from the eyes of Paul. The first thing that Paul saw when he was converted was Ananias. Ananias means God is gracious. Imagine that. This former Pharisee, this legalist, when his eyes are open to the gospel, the first thing that Paul sees in his new life in Christ, right before his very eyes, is God is gracious. Maybe you need to pray and ask God to show you his grace. Maybe you need to look up the word grace and read all the verses that talk about it. Use a concordance like Blue Letter Bible or Strong's and find it used and read every time Paul uses it over a hundred times in the New Testament to become a student of grace for a while. Or maybe there are people in your life that you know and you want them to see the grace of God. Be the Ananias in their life. Be a living example of what grace is. Extend grace. Show grace. Speak grace. Show them unmerited favor be their Ananias. It may be just what they need. As we close today, let's rest in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Paul wrote to his young disciple Timothy and said, grow in the grace of Jesus Christ. It's something that we can all grow in, no matter what our religious background, no matter what our religious tradition, there is room to grow in the grace of God. And Lord God, we thank you so much that it's not based upon works because we would never be able to achieve it. We pray, Father, today that you would give us grace, that you would show us grace, and you'd also help us to grow in your grace. 
Lord, we repent of striving in our own works to do anything that could make us more acceptable to you because you have already done that work on the cross. Lord, thank you for the gospel of grace. Give us joy as we seek and we embark upon that journey to live fully in the grace of Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.